Okay, uh, so for Trees of Australia, we're basically just going to give you a very brief overview, hitting a few high points, uh, since we are operating at a continental-wide scale here. So we'll just be skirting the surface a little bit. Um, when you look at Australia and New Zealand, uh, they're relatively isolated, uh, relatively isolated islands in the South Pacific. And to give you some context, these are Ella, or sorry, latitudinal equivalents. Um, so if you look at northern latitudes compared to these southern latitudes, the tip of the South Island of New Zealand would be roughly equivalent in latitude to the state of Maine. Here in the northern hemisphere, East Texas would be around here. And you have Cancun, Mexico about there, Central America towards the northern end of Australia. So it's got a pretty wide latitudinal range there. And in terms of elevation, relatively flat. Australia's high point only makes it up just over a mile, 7,310 feet. And it's 11 times the size of the state of Texas for some context. Australia's, or sorry, New Zealand is more mountainous. Uh, it makes it up to 12,000, over 12,000 feet elevation. Um, and it's about the size of the state of Colorado for context. Here's the geology. And really the point here is that it's very diverse as you would expect at the continental scale. And so that diverse geology is gonna build in a diversity of parent materials, which are gonna lead to some pretty diverse soils. In terms of the climate, this is gonna be pretty important because this climactic map that you see here is really gonna shape where we find the trees on this continent. And so you have a very large, very arid area covering much of the center of Australia and the West Coast as well. And so this is really gonna be primarily desert with pretty much no trees found there. Surrounding that is a region of primarily grasslands with maybe sparsely distributed trees like acacias that we'll go over today. So when you look at the range maps of most trees we'll be seeing today, they really hug the south, east, and northern coasts of Australia. New Zealand uh, varies a little bit more. It doesn't really have large areas that are desert. Um, it does have mountainous areas, particularly on the South Island, uh, that tend to shape the range maps there. And so, yeah, Raven. Um, it, it's a prevailing climate based, you know, shaped by the ocean primarily. Yeah. Um, so here are the, the maps of the different forests and you can see there's that climate map again, right? Um, where, you know, the forests are primarily along the coasts except for the west coast there. So um, with New Zealand, the North Island, I know it's hard to read that, but the North Island, a lot of this is now um, agriculture, growing exotic species. So a lot of the forest cover type has been altered in New Zealand due to human activity, so development of land. And so as we look at all these different cover types, here's how they break down. And so what you're gonna notice immediately here, looking at this table for Australia, 78% of the cover type is defined as eucalypt. And so that would be like here in North America, if you know three quarters of our cover type was oak or pine or something like that. So uh, they have a very strong presence of eucalypt. It's gonna be their most common group of trees. And you'll notice nothing else exceeds 10%. So the next highest is gonna be acacias at about 7%, melaleucas at about 5%. We'll give you an example of each of those. And everything else is pretty much 2% or less. We'll talk about calitris, casserina, both a little bit. Um, and then we'll give you an example of a mangrove here at the end. So we'll sort of cover the highlights on all those groups. But let's, let's start uh, with the most common group, so here are a bunch of different common names. This semester, we've talked about common names. We've talked about scientific names. And, you know, here's a bunch of different common names. It sounds really diverse, right? Ash, gum, black butt, wandu, box, iron bark. That sounds like a whole bunch of different tree species. And it is, but these are all in the eucalyptus genus. So, uh, the English common names are very confusing because basically uh, European colonists arrived, said, hey, this looks kind of like a tree I recognize. And so they started calling it ash, maybe, even though it was a eucalyptus. Or they started describing them based on bark or other features, even though they're all eucalyptus. 
So think about how confusing dendro would be this semester if we didn't call all our oaks oaks, right? If we called one of them a pine and one of them a hickory and one of them an ash, but they're all just different species of oaks, that would get pretty confusing. So. With eucalyptus, normally I bring in the leaves because we have the two eucalyptus growing right outside the building by the train here, uh, but eucalyptus does not like cold. And so they're pretty brown and dead right now uh, based on that weather we had a couple weeks ago. Eucalyptus can be challenging to identify. So what's the leaf arrangement here? Alternate, right? And over here, opposite. So, you know, we've learned that we can look at trees, use opposite or alternate. The challenge with eucalyptus is often they will be opposite as juveniles and then become alternate as mature trees. So one species can actually be both. So that, that can be a little more challenging. You'll notice the differences in leaf shape here as well. How some of these leaves are more round, some are more elongated, elliptical. That can be another example of variation over age, where the juvenile leaves tend to be more round, the mature leaves tend to be more elliptical. The other thing you would notice if you had a eucalyptus leaf in your hand is typically you can flip them over front, back, top, bottom. They look exactly the same on either side of the leaf which is different from most of the trees we're seeing in lab this semester. So you can't just take a leaf and pick the clear top and the clear bottom. It's not as obvious. Here's an example, again, that would be a juvenile leaf, that would be a mature leaf where the juvenile leaf is rounder. The mature leaf is gonna be much more lanceolate to elliptical. Okay, so in terms of the flowers or fruits on them, they are uh, angiosperms, so they do have flowers and fruits. The flowers are white on many species found in the spring, pretty showy, um, lots of different wildlife and people will use the nectar out of these, so the flowers are pretty popular. The fruit are capsules, uh, but the common name you typically hear used for them is going to be gum nuts, gum nuts, even though they're not actually a nut. And the neat thing about them, they tend to be found in clusters, not singly, but those clusters tend to follow a, a Fibonacci series which just means you tend to find them in low prime numbers. You tend to find them in groups of five, seven, 11, so on and so forth. The number you find in each cluster can help you tell different species apart. But of course, these trees can get hundreds of feet tall. So if that's way up in the air, it's not gonna to be too helpful to you. The bark is really gonna vary across them pretty dynamically. Lots of different types of bark on different eucalyptus species. And uh, again, when you think about those common names, a lot of them are referring to the bark on these different trees. There are lots of different products uh, made out of eucalyptus. And so um, they'll extract chemicals from them. If you just crush up a eucalyptus leaf, it's really, really fragrant. If you're familiar with like Vicks Vaporub, you can kind of recognize that scent as being similar to Vicks Vapor Vaporub. One of the ingredients on it is going to be eucalyptol, uh, an oil derived from it. People have used them for uh, natural insecticides where, you know, people don't want to use um, feed or other chemicals like that. How effective they are, I don't know. Um, and then, of course, this whole essential oil thing has blown up over the last couple of years. And you got to be careful with these. Apparently, this is killing and injuring a bunch of people because they're overdoing it. Some of the compounds they can extract from different, different eucalyptus taxis will be mutagenic, so they can cause cancer, among other things. So you got to be careful. They're pretty powerful chemicals in these trees. Okay, uh, so let's talk about a, a number of different specific species here. Um, the first up will be mountain ash. And so this is Myrtaceae. All the eucalyptus are in the Myrtaceae family. This one's Eucalyptus regnans. You can see here it's found in the island of Tasmania and then down here um, in southeastern Australia. And the morphology is kind of everything we just went over, where it's got the gum nuts, it's got those sort of bluish lanceolate leaves, stringy bark. So similar morphology to everything we just looked at. Now the specific epithet is regnant. Regnant means royalty, king or queen. And so this is the world's tallest eucalyptus species, but it's not just the world's tallest eucalyptus species. This is the world's tallest angiosperm. So the tallest angiosperm on the planet is found in Australia. It's a eucalyptus regnans called Centurion. 
Um, and you can see the tree here. Here's a person with some ropes up it that's been climbing it. And it's 101 meters tall, which is 331.3 feet. For these really tall trees, they don't get out a clinometer or anything like that and use that to estimate the height on them. First off, there's nowhere you could stand where you can actually see the tree and see the top and the bottom. You'd have to be so far away and there's so many other trees around them. It just doesn't work, but it, it's not gonna be accurate anyway. So they actually climb to the top of them and drop a tape measure down. And so these are actual measurements on these really, really tall trees. The thing's about 13 feet in DBH. And so just to give you another idea of how big these trees get, that's a picture of a stump with someone standing by it. That's not the tree described here. But there was a, a report in a newspaper of one felled in 1942. Uh, they claimed it was 65 feet in circumference. So you divide their circumference by pi, and that's a tree that would have been about 20 feet in DBH. So enormous tree, um, and they reported it yielded 6,770 cubic feet of wood. So just an enormous volume on that one tree. Um, which if you pulp that, it would have been pulped into about 75 tons of newsprint. Uh, the report claimed it took two axemen two and a half days uh, to cut this tree down. So they didn't have chainsaws to use. Um, even if they did, it's not going to do much on a tree that big, right? Uh, to get a sense for, you know, how much 75 tons is, I you know, went ahead and threw that into Google image search. And this is what Google image search that out for 75 tons. So Pretty large tree when it's comparing it to large ships or aircraft. If that tree was growing right by the side of the forestry building here, that's what it would look like next to Steam Hall. So that, that would be the scale. Yeah, Raven. Um, these trees can get pretty old. Um, they can uh, be easily in excess of 300 years, probably much older than that. Yeah. They grow pretty quickly. So um, here's some researchers that have done a lot of work on big trees throughout the world, um, and they've created these maps where what they'll do is they'll climb up into the canopies. They've developed their own equipment to move around in these canopies. That's a combination of rock climbing or, or cultural techniques, all sorts of other techniques where they can move easily throughout the entire canopy. And they'll go and they'll measure every limb, every few feet, get the diameters on them. They'll measure the main trunk every few feet, get the diameters on it, and they'll build these maps. And so you can see these maps of these different eucalyptus regnans trees. Um, on the right, what you're seeing is trees that are, you know, that one's over 90 meters tall. So that one's almost 300 feet tall right there. And so if you look, some of these, you know, things that just appear to be branches, especially one like that, that would be the size of a mature lava like pine tree out in a plantation ready for clear cut around here. And it's just a limb on this really huge tree. Um, you, you can see they've got maps of the stem at different heights. So they're circular by the time you get 20 meters off the ground. But as you get closer to the ground, they end up with all these buttress roots and, and flared stems that help them be more wind firm. Um, the folks doing this research pictured here, that's Steve Sillett and Marie Antoine. Uh, they're out of, um, let's see, I think it's uh, Northern California. And uh, they've done a lot of work on coastal redwood too. Uh, but uh, Steve Sillett here was profiled in a book by Richard Preston, the guy that wrote the hot zone about the near sort of Ebola outbreak in DC uh, decades ago, but wrote, wrote a book about this guy and how he climbs trees and everything. And it's pretty interesting. So I guess Marie Antoine was his grad student and now they're married. They actually got married up in some big redwoods, but all sorts of salacious details about their relationship when she was still a grad student. And, I guess he went through a rough divorce and taught for a few years with a shaved head, including eyebrows and mechanics coveralls. So all sorts of interesting details in that book, but they, they've done a bunch of really interesting research up in these trees. Okay, so here's another species of eucalyptus. This is Southern blue gum, or Taceae eucalyptus globulus. And it has a similar range to eucalyptus regnans. It's found in Southeast Australia. Um, these are some areas that get pretty high rainfall, so you can think of these as sort of temperate rainforests, if you will. Um, and again, similar morphology to the other eucalyptus that we've looked at so far. Here you can see one growing in a park, That's a pretty large tree there. I've thrown this one in here because this is among 
the many species that are commonly managed through, for timber throughout the world. And so when eucalyptus grows in Australia, Australia gets droughts that make our droughts here in East Texas look like nothing. They'll get decade long droughts, very severe droughts. Eucalyptus is well adapted to handling droughts and it basically just sits there and survives, but it doesn't grow very much. Then you get rainfall, it gets adequate soil moisture and they can photosynthesize at a rate four times as high as lava pine, for example, and they can grow very rapidly when the growing conditions are right. And so they'll take large logs of slow grown eucalyptus in you know, Southeast Australia. You can mill those into pretty nice timber. But what we found, what a lot of people have found is if you take eucalyptus out of that droughty climate in Australia and you plant it in regions that get more uniform rainfall, like China, like Brazil, like India, it just grows rapidly all year round. And so they've moved a bunch of eucalyptus species, including globulus, to other countries, other continents throughout the world, and they use them very much for timber production. So here you can get a sense of scale of that. So they call this eucalyptus universalis, just saying it's it spread pretty universally. These numbers are hectares. A hectare is just shy of two and a half acres. Um, so you, you end up with about 25 million acres between Brazil, India, and China combined. And then you can see Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, South Africa. You've got lots of other countries with quite a bit of eucalyptus. We've attempted to introduce it into the southern U.S. numerous times over the last hundred plus years. And it keeps coming back to it being expensive to establish. So that's an economic barrier and then getting the genetics right. It's not very tolerant of cold. And so that's another challenge that we find. So, so we don't have it very widespread in the US South, but it has been planted some. If you ever go out to California, you'll see some really big eucalyptus in some areas in California where they planted it there. It's become a little bit of an invasive species for some of them. Yeah, well. Oh yeah, yeah, they're, they're definitely, especially where they're actively managing it. For pulp production, uh, there are tree improvement programs heavily involved there. Yeah. And so if you, you know, use it in its native range in Australia, slow grown for timber, it makes some pretty decent timber uh, that can be used for higher end products. But then where they're managing it in countries like Brazil, large companies like this one, what they do is they have a rooted cuttings program. So they kind of grow them up as little shrubs, they sprout. They clip them and they get those cuttings to root. And so they end up propagating these forests clonally. And so every tree in the stand is genetically identical to every other tree in the stand. And they will grow these things on a four to six to eight year rotation. And in four to six to eight years, they're gonna be harvesting 80 foot tall plus trees. And so they grow them just incredibly rapidly, but a tree growing that quickly, you know, it doesn't have great timber quality, but it has good fiber quality. So they're primarily using these to uh, fill the need for pulp mills. So they're using them to grow pulp. So that's a little bit on eucalyptus globulus and some of the, the use throughout the, the world for eucalyptus. Uh, this is eucalyptus comulgulensis, red river gum. And so this is one of the more famous species of eucalyptus in Australia. Um, and you can see it's got a pretty wide range. It grows pretty much anywhere forests grow. Um, in the continent that we've already looked at, but you can see it ranges pretty far inland here to some of these more arid areas. It's not gonna be found everywhere within these regions as the name implies river gum. It tends to be a riparian species. So just like you'll see cottonwoods along rivers out in the Western US in areas that are otherwise pretty arid, you know, that, that's where you would find red river gum. Um, some of them are, are pretty famous where they've, you know, they're sort of the last tree standing in an area that pretty much doesn't have any trees left. So uh, they used a lot for tourism, photography, things like that. Um, it has been brought into California. It's a little bit invasive in California. Um, I got a couple of these pictures where again, you can see sort of what we looked at earlier. The juvenile leaves are opposite. And then as you get more mature leaves on it, they become alternate, but it's that same sort of blue green leaf that's double-sided. They all look pretty similar. Um, this eucalyptus species, Camalgiolensis, is long-lived. 
So it can live in excess of 700 years. So pretty old. It's very resistant to rot and it's very resistant to decay. Um, so around here, we might use Eastern red cedar or black locust as species that are really good for fence posts because they're rot and decay resistant. Well, you would use Eucalyptus camaldulensis in Australia for those same purposes. Uh, because it's a riparian species, it's also very important for different fisheries on some major rivers. And so here's someone with a champion river blackfish that they've caught. But what they found is both in periods of flood where the rivers come out of their banks, uh, they form a lot of habitat structure for fisheries. But then even during periods of normal flow, uh, these trees, of course, drop big limbs and they die and ultimately fall into streams if they're growing beside streams. And so all that wood in the streams is forming critical habitat for fisheries as well. Um, much like here in the US, they pulled a lot of wood out of their streams, trying to make them more navigable, then realized the ecological importance and have now been putting wood back into the streams. We've done very similar things here throughout the US. Eucalyptus camaldulensis is one of the more cold tolerant eucalyptus species. And so that does make it among the species that are gonna be more suitable for growing here in the Southern US. And to give you an example for uh, the cold tolerance of these species, if you get a minimum temperature during a night that drops down to 17 degrees Fahrenheit, it'll flat out top fill. And it's one of the more cold tolerant species. So you can see if you're trying to grow them for 10 years, there's pretty good odds around here in a 10 year period, we're gonna get at least one night that gets that cold, right? And so it makes them pretty challenging to grow. I took this photo during a field station and we were actually in Louisiana. And so this is a plantation of Eucalyptus camaldulensis. Um, a company named Midwest Vaco uh, had established about 8,000 acres of this in Southeast Texas and Southwest Louisiana. So in Texas, they're near like China, Texas, Sour Lake. Um, and then in Louisiana, they're near Maryville, Singer, those sort of areas. And the idea was they would fill the need for the Eva Dale paper mill uh, for high quality pulp because it's actually growing in areas where some of the counties right around it, they only have 7% forested land. It's a lot of rice agriculture and other agricultural uses. So during periods where it's really wet and they have scarcity of wood, that pulp mill has been shipping in wood from Mississippi, Alabama, South America, just all over the world, barging it in uh, to keep the mill up and running. So what they did is they would lease land on a 10 year lease from landowners. They had some areas where they converted um, rice paddy agriculture. They had other areas where they converted uh, uplands that were in pine plantations into these eucalyptus stands this is probably a one or two year old stand right here and you can see the trees are already shoulder height. Um, and so what they were finding is the trees, you know, by age four were easily 20 plus feet tall. They were growing pretty rapidly. Stem form was really poor. That's something you often try to fix through genetics. But the main issue they ran into was just really expensive. In some of these old rice fields they were converting, they were having to apply herbicides seven or eight times in the first couple of years trying to establish eucalyptus, uh, you know, pine plantations, we might apply herbicide twice at most in the first, you know, 10 years. And so just much more intensive herbicide application. During droughty summers, they were going out and watering them with a watering truck, you know, one or two times to keep the seedlings from dying. And so it ended up costing them, I don't know, probably 1500 bucks in some of these cases an acre to try to establish these. Midwest Vaco ended up merging with a company called Tenrock, the new company, named West Rock. Um, and I guess once they merged, the corporate office looked at the you know, cost of this program, decided it wasn't worth continuing. And so they abandoned it. That probably would have been about six years ago now. But you can still drive through some areas in Southeast Texas, Southwest Louisiana. And you know, you're driving around an area with mostly like rice fields and all of a sudden, what the heck is this? And it's, it's a eucalyptus stand growing. So there are still some of them. And again, this is probably the seventh or eighth time we've tried to introduce eucalyptus in the Southern US and each time something like this happens where it just doesn't quite make it to the point where it's economically viable. Okay, uh, next up we have red bloodwood, eucalyptus gamifera. Um, they've been sort of debating the taxonomy on this one since the mid nineties. Uh, you may find it in the Carimbia genus 
uh, I think that's C O R Y M B I A. Um, that may be the most up to date genus on this one, uh, but it is closely related to eucalyptus, same family, uh, regardless of what genus you put it in. Um, this species is going to be a popular ornamental, um, even when it's not planted as an ornamental itself. We'll use it as a root stock for other trees in the same genus that you know may have better ornamental properties that they'll plant out, grafted onto this as a root stock. It's a hardy root stock. Um, but what's most notable about this is it gets this red, thick, viscous resin that comes out of the tree. Well, all the eucalyptus are pretty resistant to insects and disease, like we've been looking at. So in this particular tree's case, you know, the resin happened to be red that helps it resist all those attacks. So if you injure the bark on them, it starts oozing that red resin, which is why it's called a, a blood wood. It's like the wood will bleed. So um, the wood on this is also nice. You can kind of see a, a dead tree here where the bark is sloughed off. And it, it's really a, a dark red sort of mahogany uh, looking wood as well. So an attractive wood on this tree. Okay, these next two I kind of want to look at together. So here's two specific species of eucalyptus. This is eucalyptus crebra, narrow leaf red iron bark. Uh, this is a tree that's important uh, for the honey industry. And so we actually use trees for honey here in the south. They do in Australia as well. You can see it's growing in relatively sort of low rainfall, more open woodland type forests, you know, similar to many forests we might see in central Texas, right? And here's the range down here in southeastern Australia. So it's another southeastern species. Now, one tree that'll commonly grow with it is gray box, Myrtaceae eucalyptus microcarpa. And again, you're seeing this open woodland ecosystem. And so it's two different species of eucalyptus, okay, microcarpa, but they have different common names, iron bark box. And so they've actually lumped them together into what they call a box iron bark cover type. But it's just eucalyptus, right? So it's just two species of eucalyptus. Well, you know, Southeast Australia is a heavily inhabited region of the country. And so they've gone through the same things we've seen here in North America. They've had various gold rushes where they've gone in there and done extractive mining. They've used a lot of timbers for the mining to make flumes, to make mine pilings. They've gone through and they've harvested timber for construction, um, and they've converted a lot of land to agriculture, and they have urban development as well. So same things we see in North America, and basically this box iron bark cover type is now endangered. And so down here in Southeast Australia, they'll have these box iron bark parks, so preserved national parks, um, except the problem is what they're running into is they've got the overstory of these eucalyptus species, but they're not seeing much regeneration. They're not seeing many new seedlings coming in. And so the question there is sort of what's going on, why? And these are areas where some people don't believe fire is a part of these ecosystems. They don't really have very good records on how much the indigenous peoples here would have been burning prior to European colonization. And so now there's a lot of question as to, you know, why aren't we getting new cohorts of trees? Do we need to be burning? Is that something this ecosystem would require? And so they're doing some experimenting now to sort of figure out, will prescribed fire help, you know, bring back these cover types? Okay, so we've talked about eucalyptus. That's the dominant tree cover type. They've got a lot of indigenous wildlife uh, there in Australia. So lots of marsupials, right? So they've got the the common ones everyone's heard about, like koalas. They've got lots of other less common ones, like the endangered chuttage there. Um, it's a carnivore, so you know all sorts of different mammals there. They also have fake wildlife, just like we have here in the U.S. So uh, they don't have the Sasquatch or the Bigfoot. They have the bunyip. And so here's an artist's depiction of a bunyip eating a person in a swamp. Uh, but the bunyip is commonly found in swamps, apparently. It's not found on uplands. And so some people have been looking into, you know, all these claims of the bunyip eating people in swamps. And uh, there's an alternative theory that's come out. Apparently, they have a native bird called the barking owl, this goofy-looking owl. And uh, 
it, it likes wetter habitat areas. And so it's found in some of these same swampy areas the bunyip apparently roams in. And Wikipedia has a great description of the call of the barking owl as a shrill human-like howl of great intensity. So, you know, that's, that's one theory on what the bunyip may be, a goofy looking big eyed owl, so. Okay, so that's acacias, uh, or sorry, that's eucalyptus. Next up, let's look at the acacias. And so these are in the Fabaceae family. Uh, they're gonna be pretty diverse. There's almost a thousand species. Most of those are not trees. Only about 50 of them are gonna reach tree-like stature. They're commonly called wattles, not acacias in Australia. And if, you may have a hard time seeing it, but if you look at the range here, what you'll notice is the range maps are pushed inland, sometimes pretty far from the coasts. And so these are trees that can handle more arid environments as you move away from the wetter coastal areas. So we'll look at two species here. Um, the first up is Cudamundra wattle, Fabaceae acacia baleana. And uh, when you look at this one, you know, you've got pinately to bipinately compound leaves, right? You've got the legumes that look kind of like silk tree, and you've got these showy yellow flowers. Uh, this tree kind of has an interesting story. You see that it's an obvious ornamental, right? And so uh, what they've done is this was native to a few small areas in Southeast Australia. They moved it not too far, just slightly outside of those areas and started planting it. And it kind of became an invasive pest pretty close to within its own region. Um, so that would be like if we brought a tree over from Mississippi here to East Texas and it became an invasive pest. So it's not something we usually think about uh, here in North America, but they're actually finding it in Australia. And it's not just this acacia species, they're seeing it with other acacia species. Next up is blackwood, Fabaceae acacia melanoxalon. Um, and so blackwood, melon, referring to the pigment melanin, which is dark in color, xylon referring to wood. So blackwood is right there. And this is an epithet as well. And it does have a, a darker colored wood. So that's how that the scientific name is set up. Uh, this is longer live than most of the other acacias. Acacias are generally short life species, less than hundred years, but this one lives longer than hundred years. Acacias are also generally smaller trees because they're growing in arid environments. They tend to be 50 feet tall or less. Um, this one can make it between 60 and 100 feet in height. So it's kind of taller than the other acacias as well. Here you see the leaf and it's kind of confusing what's going on there. Um, is it simple? Is it compound? What you're actually seeing here, these are true leaves, these compound leaves here, but those are juvenile leaves. So those are the juvenile leaves, which are compound. As it becomes mature, you can see this one growing in a botanical garden. It, it kind of looks like a magnolia. And it's because this is what you're seeing right here is the leaf. That's not actually a true simple leaf, that mature foliage. What that is, it's called a phyloide, P-H-Y-L-L-O-I-D-E, phyloide. And what it is, it's not a true leaf. It's just a really wide petiole. There is no leaf blade at the end of the petiole. So it's obviously doing the same thing as a leaf. It's just not technically a leaf as such. So, um, so that, that's another thing like we saw with the eucalyptus where it's gonna make leaf ID more difficult because that juvenile and mature foliage looks very different. Okay, uh, we've already talked about how the common names are confusing for eucalyptus, but outside of eucalyptus, the common names get even more confusing. So I have oaks and quotation marks up there because the oaks they have not only are not oaks, they're not in the Fagaceae family, they're not in the Quercus genus, they're not even angiosperms. These oaks are actually gymnosperms. And so what they call oaks are in the Cassariniaceae family, the Cassarina genus. And uh, here, you know, I don't know where this photo was taken. This could very easily have been taken on a Caribbean island. They've been widely planted uh, in um, North America um, in, in a lot of different Caribbean islands. When you walk up to them or when you see them from a, a little bit of ways, they look kind of like pines and they, they look like they have needles. But these are not needles because pine needles are actually leaves. They're one type of leaf. These don't have leaves. They actually have photosynthetic branchlets. 
So it's a twig that has a lot of chlorophyll in it that's serving the same function as a leaf. So they have those photosynthetic branchlets. Um, you can see that's salt water, so they can handle some really tough environments where it's very difficult for trees to grow. One way they do that is by fixing nitrogen. So we commonly think of lagoons, members of the Fabaceae being our most common trees that fix nitrogen. Here's a gymnosperm that also fixes nitrogen. So, so here's one species of oak. So this is a river oak, Cassariniaceae, Cassarina cunninghamiana. And again, here you see it growing right by the ocean. So it can handle the salt, tough environment there. That bark might look similar to post oak we'll learn in lab this semester. So the bark kind of resembles some of our oaks. Uh, the cones don't look like a pine cone at all. You can see each scale is raised and pointed there. So you're not gonna confuse that with a pine cone. It's got an Eastern distribution and a Northern distribution along the coasts in Australia. But again, river oak, it's not found everywhere in that region. It's primarily a riparian species. But here you see a bunch of them potted up being grown in the nursery tree. This is a, a very popular ornamental and urban tree in this region. Okay, they have a lot of pines too, but just like the oaks, the pines aren't pines. Um, they're not in the Pinaceae family. They're not in the Pinus genus. They are at least gymnosperms. That's a little less confusing than the oaks. So here's Norfolk Island pine. It's Aralcariaceae. This is our first member of the Aralcariaceae. And so if you'll remember, this was pretty much a Southern Hemisphere family when we went over it back in lecture five, talking about taxonomy. And this one's Aralcaria heterophylla. And you can see it's only found out here in Norfolk Island, which is this tiny island way east of Australia. So it's found out pretty isolated in the South Pacific there. And when you look at them, this tree has not been pruned. This tree has not been bred. This is just how they grow, okay? So they've got that really cool growth form where they get these whorls that are pretty evenly spaced. They form this nice pyramid shaped crown. Um, has anyone been in South Florida or further South in Texas and seen trees that look like this? It probably was Norfolk Island pine. This has been planted as an ornamental. If you tried it here in Nacogdoches County, it would probably get killed by cold. But if you head further South, you'll start seeing them as a popular ornamental. And you can ID these things from like 10 city blocks away. Um, you can see them way far away and nothing else quite grows like that. So it's got short little on like needles you can see there. Um, and then the cones, uh, they look like dice hang from a rear view mirror or something like that. So totally different looking cones uh, than anything we've seen thus far. Here's white cypress pine, Cupressaceae colitris glauca. Colitris was the name of one of those cover types we looked at at the beginning of the lecture that covered one or two percent um, of their forest land. And so you can see the range map on it goes really far inland. It's not going to be found broad spread, broadly spread everywhere within that whole range. Uh, you know, in some of these drier areas, it might be found only, you know, right along small streams, wetter areas, protected areas. That's where you would find it. Um, but this is kind of their equivalent of the junipers that we have here um, in, in the U.S., especially like the Western U.S., where um, it's got the scale-like foliage like our junipers do. It's got smaller woody cones here, unlike our junipers, but it's kind of filling that same ecological role. Yeah, right. So, you know, once you're here in the middle of the desert and it's really arid, you're only going to find it in specific sites where it's either sheltered or, you know, riparian area. As you get closer to the coast where it gets more music, you're going to see it a little more widely distributed. Yeah. Um, so here, this is, this is a, an example of one of their species that does well with fire. Uh, it's a fire adapted tree, you know, just like many we've got here in North America. Here's one more member of the Aralcariaceae. This is cowrie tree. And we've been primarily focusing on Australia, but here's a tree found in New Zealand. So there's the North Island of New Zealand. Um, they used to have 3 million acres of cowrie. They're down to about 200,000 acres. And so much of it has been lost due to overlogging, um, as well as land use conversion to agriculture. Um, or, you know, other forest tree species that they're planting in New Zealand, like lobelite pine, radiata pine, um, other species from North America. 
Uh, this tree is sacred to the Maori people, and so now those that are left are protected. It's going to be illegal to harvest any of these that remain. This is a really cool tree. They can reach 150 feet in height, so they get really large. Um, they've aged some of them over 1,500 years, so it's going to get very old. Um, and the trunks on these can exceed 15 feet in DBH. The Arrow Caryaceae is a gymnosperm family. Um, and you can see here, it's got just an odd cone. I'm not going to confuse that with a pine cone. I might confuse it with an artichoke, but it doesn't really look like a pine cone at all. Now, while it's found in New Zealand, you see it does have Australis as the specific epithet there. In that context, Australis just means southern, southern hemisphere is what that's really referring to. So, so it's illegal to log these, uh, but they're still occasionally finding some of them. Um, so here's an example where you can see you're out in, you know, some sort of sheep pasture or something, and uh, they've got excavators out, and what you can see is here's a full-sized semi-truck with this trailer on it, and they're putting one log on this trailer using two excavators to do it. And so what happened is sometimes these cowrie trees, remember, they get huge, 15-foot DBH, you know, thousands of years ago, they may have fallen down, but they fell in a swamp. And so the water covered them, they got sedimented in, no oxygen, so the wood didn't rot, it didn't decompose. And now they're finding these sometimes by accident and they're pulling them out. They get them huge size, that tree may be 20, 30,000 years old. They take it to a specialty mill and here's one conference table made out of a single board. And the grain on these, I mean, the only thing around here you might compare it to is maybe like bird's eye maple or something, but just got this crazy, really attractive grain to it. So you can imagine, you know, thousands of years old, currently illegal to log this species, huge size, beautiful grain. I don't know what that's selling for, but it's a lot. Yeah, well, the scientific names up here at the top, Arocariaceae agathus australis. Australis means southern, southern, yeah. Um, so we have the what, Aurora borealis in the Northern hemisphere and in the Southern hemisphere, the same concept as the Aurora australis. Okay, so that was a little bit on their gymnosperms. Um, here's uh, some more angiosperms. This is Australian boobab, Bombacea adansonia gregorii. We'll talk about other boobabs in Africa. This is the one boobab that's found in Australia. So, um, and they they moved it more recently from the Bombacea family to the Malbacea family, where the other boobabs are found. This tree is very easy to identify because of the swollen trunk. The swollen trunk on it makes it very obvious. Uh, that's a tactic to survive arid environments. It you know, will hold a lot of water. Here you can see its range actually in Northwestern Australia. So it's, it's deciduous. Here's the palmately compound leaves with it leafed out, but it is gonna drop those leaves. There are apparently not just one, but several of these trees uh, that have been hollowed out and uh, they're now visited by tourists, protected. Uh, but, you know, these have kind of a sketchy history where they're called prison trees. And basically what happened is European settlers uh, would be, you know, moving Aboriginal pe peoples they'd arrested around, and they'd be taking them to, you know, one place or another. And as they were traveling, they would temporarily imprison them in these hollowed out bow trees. And so that happened in the late 1800s. And so there's a bunch of them around now with this historical context. Okay, one of those cover types that had about 2% coverage was the Melaleuca, and Melaleuca are known as paper marks. And you can see why they're called paper marks right here. They have very papery bark. And so here's five vein paper mark, Melaleuca quinca nervia. And quinca means five, nervia means vein. So there you go, five vein paper mark right in the name. You can see these are in the Myrtaceae family, which is the same family as Eucalyptus. And you can see the range on this five vein paper mark is going to be eastern and northeastern Australia. So, right along the coast. They have brought these trees into the US. Um, they don't survive in temperate ecoregions, it's too cold, but they do survive in subtropical ecoregions. And the two places in the continental US we have subtropical ecoregions are South Texas and South Florida. 
And so South Florida, when you go and look at South Florida, there's a lot of development there. They've brought in lots of ornamental species that have become invasive. This is one of them. And so this is a, a pretty bad invasive species in South Florida, but it doesn't handle cold. So it's not a problem anywhere else really in the US at the moment. But you can see why they brought it in. Pretty flowers, pretty bark, nice ornamental until, oops. Okay, just have two left to go over. Uh, this is strangler fig. So this is gonna be in the, the ficus genus, which is in the Moraceae. We're gonna learn red mulberry this week in lab. So the Moraceae is the mulberry family. This is ficus oblica. So again, I mentioned figs briefly in the first lecture, but there's 750 of these worldwide. Sometimes they get pretty large and they're known as banyans. Um, but this is a really unique um, fig from an ecological perspective. So if you think about a tree in a forest, it's fruiting all the time, it's dropping seed, if it's an angiosperm, right? It's fruiting, dropping seed, it's trying to replace itself, okay? But think about what that seed has to go through. The seed has to fall in the right spot, just get lucky. It has to germinate, it has to then grow into the right environment, and in a, an intact forest with lots of shade, it has to somehow be able to wait around until a big canopy tree right near it dies. And then it has to grow faster than everything else around it and take probably decades to make it back into the overstory and become a dominant, dominant canopy tree. So that's literally a one in a million thing that occurs. Trees are producing millions of seeds over the life. So that, that's the strategy. Strangler fig looked at that and said, mm, nah, I'm not going to do that. So what strangler fig does is, you know, figs are good. Wildlife like to eat them. It's a good soft mask. So wildlife, birds will eat them. They'll go crap out the seeds. Some of them will fall on branches high up in a canopy. Okay. And then what strangler fig does is it grows like a vine. And it grows as a vine on an intact canopy tree. And it eventually makes it top to bottom. And then it eventually starts growing all the way around that canopy tree to the point where you can see here, here's the canopy tree, what's left of it in the middle. And all these that appear to be vines around it or the strangler fig, it'll eventually girdle and kill the canopy tree that it has grown. On. Well, once that happens, you know, the tree in the middle starts rotting. That's just like a big mature tree with heart rot, right? We've all seen the trick, right? Where you can stand on a 12 ounce aluminum soda can even though that aluminum is real thin and real weak, that shape of a cylinder is very strong and hold a lot of weight. And so, you know, even though the middle rots out, it's strong. And so basically what the strangler fig has evolved to do, it's evolved to steal a canopy position from a tree that was already, you know, that one in the million shot and made it, it just goes in and steals it. So it wasn't gonna wait for that to happen by chance. And then last up, we saw about 1% of the cover type uh, was in the mangroves. And so here you see the main, the range map. This is small stilted mangrove. And if you already know anything about mangroves, you know they grow in coastal areas and estuaries, right? So here it is. And no surprise, the range map is the coast, basically. And so when you look at the scientific name, rhizophoraceae, rhizophora stylosa, rhizo means root. Rhizo means root. And so roots are clearly one of the more important things here on this small stilted mangrove because they're growing in areas where you have to deal with tides, high tide, low tide. So they're dealing with this fluctuating water table. So their roots act as stilts, you know, just like houses built along coastal areas for when it will flood. And so at high tide, the leaves are still mostly above the water and at low tide, they keep them in place so that they don't wash out. And so there's the roots to that. Mangroves have all sorts of cool adaptations to basically grow in salt water. Um, some species may actually exude little salt crystals out of the leaves, all sorts of cellular adaptations so that that level of salt doesn't suck all the moisture out of their cells, desiccating them and, and killing them. So all sorts of cool physiological and anatomical adaptations to handle all that salt. But they're really important ecologically. They can help stabilize, you know, coastal dune areas. Um, when high tide comes in, you've got a ton of physical habitat structure there in the water for all sorts of different taxa. So ecologically, they're gonna be really important. Um, if you ever have to go working in them or hiking through mangroves, good luck. You know, you can make like half a mile an hour trying to get through that. Yeah, are they, great. Are they world or like 
I, I believe that they are alternate, but you're seeing short internode growth there, similar to what we're going to see um, in our azaleas uh, this semester. In March. Yeah. And if you're familiar with mangroves along the Texas coast, elsewhere in North America, it's not this species, but all the species of mangroves, you know, a lot of what I just went over is pretty much true for the whole family there, whole genus. So. Okay, so that's trees of Australia. Any questions? <laughs> 